The Honorable Jessica Mitford was born in 1917 with the proverbial silver spoon in her mouth, which she later exchanged for a meat skewer to prod the sensibilities of the establishment both in her native England and in her adopted home, the United States. It is her searing attacks and exposés of venal institutions that caused Time magazine to name her Queen of the Muckrakers. Jessica, known as Decca to her family and friends, is a member of the bizarre and legendary Mitford family, which the Washington Post described as one of the more stunning contributions to the lore of English upper-class eccentricity. Of her five sisters, one, Nancy, became a respected and widely read novelist and biographer. Another, Deborah, is the Duchess of Devonshire and mistress of Chatsworth, one of England's largest and most elegant stately homes. Another, Diana, married Sir Oswald Mosley, leader of the British fascists prior to World War II, and together they spent the war years in an English prison for their pro-Nazi sentiments. But the most notorious was Shirley Unity, who was a fanatical follower of Adolf Hitler, went to Germany and became Hitler's only foreign friend and confidant in the period just before their two countries went to war. She ended their relationship by shooting herself in the English garden in Munich the day war was declared. Jessica marched to a very different drummer. As a child, she opened up a bank account in which to deposit her weekly pocket money to create a running away fund. Where she eventually ran to was Spain at the height of the Spanish Civil War to join the anti-Franco forces. She had teamed up with her cousin, a young communist sympathizer, Esmond Romilly, who also happened to be a nephew of Sir Winston Churchill. And soon the two firebrand radicals were married and had one child. Romilly was killed in action during World War II, but their escapades, as well as her earlier years, was the subject of her first highly successful and extremely amusing book called Ons and Rebels in England and published as Daughters and Rebels in America. While working in Washington, D.C., she met and married her present husband, a New York labor lawyer of left-wing leanings, Robert Truhaft, and they now live in Oakland, California. Her second autobiography, A Fine Old Conflict, tells of their years as members of the American Communist Party, from which they resigned in 1958, and the problems that they had had during the McCarthy era from the Un-American Activities Committee. But her greatest fame came from a virulent and very funny attack on the American funeral industry called The American Way of Death, a book which wittily removed the shroud from the money-grubbing practices of undertakers, or morticians as they are called in America, many of whom exploit the grief of family death for their own financial gain. I asked her what had been the reaction of the funeral industry to its publication. It was marvelous. I mean, it's the most thrilling moment of my life. It was very exciting because, uh, first of all, well, as you can imagine, the undertakers attacked with all possible fury. Um, and they attacked, the, uh, they attacked me as being a red menace and the book as being a red menace. And, there was a wonderful letter from uh, Forest Lawn Cemetery in which they um, resuscitated all the things that the House Committee on Un-American Activities had, had to say about me. And um, so they put all that in, and then they said that the book was a communist plot to subvert our wonderful, fine American standards of burial, <laughs> you see. And they sent this letter to uh, sort of a round-robin letter to all the clergy in the whole Los Angeles area. In other words, Protestant, Jewish, Catholic, you know, everybody got one. And then they said in the letter that our lawyers are preparing a lawsuit against Miss Mitford and her book. Now, I was waiting like a cat in cream for the lawsuit. I thought that would be wonderful. I should like to have defended. But they never brought the suit. Has there been any change in the American Way of Death since your book? Well, in fact, there has. There's been uh, two fairly significant changes. The first was that the Federal Trade Commission, it's, a, it's the watchdog of consumer uh, interests and protection, after years of research, finally came up only two years ago in, in um, 
1984, in the spring of 84, with a rule that would go far to knock out some of the props from the undertakers, namely, they have to make full price disclosure over the phone. Until then, you know, they'd say, oh, price is too sensitive a matter, we can't discuss it by phone, you'll have to come in. Well, once you're in, you know, it's come into my parlour, said the spider to the fly. Somebody who I l later got to know very well, a local man, uh, advertising man called Howard Gossage, who was one of the most amusing people you ever wanted to meet. Anyway, Howard wrote to me out of the blue and said that he'd been arranging uh, the funeral for his mother. And um, like most people in such circumstances, he was in a sort of fog of unhappiness and uncertainty as to what to do and all that sort of thing. So um, he chose the casket, and the undertaker then said, um, now you must choose the, um, the lining for the casket. And he showed two swatches of material that seemed to be identical in, in color and everything else. And so Howard said, well, what's the difference? And the undertaker said, well, see, this one is pure silk. And, of course, it's more expensive. This one is rayon, and it's cheaper, but we do find it's a lot more irritating to the skin. <laughs> so Howard wrote and told me that, and after that we became firm friends. <laughs> and so that kind of thing. But the, but the more significant one, I think, really, is the sudden proliferation over the past few years of direct cremation outfits that... Um, that do it all, you know, with no, no, no embalming, no coffin. And the, the undertakers hate that. They call it burn and scatter, or, or even bake and shake. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, this is taking away a great deal of the trade from the undertakers. As a, uh, a foreign aristocrat who has been a, a member of the Communist Party, does that give you a lot of trouble with acceptance in middle America? And that must be an anathema to middle America. It's very hard to answer that because I do do a certain amount of lecturing which takes me around to the Middle West and to the South. And um, in a way, I don't think it has hurt, you know. I mean, I've, be, I've had some extraordinary experiences, really, in lecturing to these groups. For instance, I was in um, a place called Vidalia, Georgia. Now, that's a tiny little town in Georgia. It's about population 12,000. It's so small that even people in um, Savannah, about 100 miles away, have hardly heard of it. Well, uh, th th this thing was called the Ohupi Public Library, and I was asked to go and speak there. And um, so they were having a symposium or a series of meetings on death, which is very big these days on college campuses and library circles and that. Um, in other words, they were going to have a clergyman on the religious aspect, a um, philosopher on the philosophic aspects, and me on the industry, I guess, the comic aspects. <laughs> so anyhow, the library, of course, had announced this through press releases. And the American Legion attacked heavily. And they came up, and they, and they in all the newspapers around, including all the Savannah papers, um, great headlines about what is the subversive doing speaking in the OHP public library, you see. So the librarians, you know, fought back with First Amendment rights and everybody has the right to have his or her say in the OHP public library. They had the uh, gumption, I thought, to send out invitations and special tickets free to all the people in the undertaking profession from miles around uh, that is, undertakers themselves and everybody connected with the industry. So when the m night of the meeting came, there had been so much publicity that it had to be changed from a small hall into the public high school auditorium. And it was packed. So the chairman repeated, you know, the fracas with the American Legion and repeated the principles of the librarians, which were First Amendment principles, right to speak. And... Um, then he said that, um, in conformity with this principle, we've invited members of the funeral profession, and if any have come, will they please stand? Upon which 12 black suits rose all together in a body, you know. And so um, I gave my talk, which was well received, because even in Vidalia, people have been victimized, you know, by the funeral people. And um, so then, following the chairman's lead, there was a question period, and I said, I'd first like to give the floor to anybody here from the funeral profession who would like to start off, you know. So a man got up and he said, I am a vault man. 
meaning I am a vault man, I sell vaults, he said. I sell vaults. And he said, I listened to Miss Mitford's speech, and I didn't hear her say that when Jesus Christ our Lord was crucified, a rich man gave him his vault. And then he sat down, so I said, well, as I spend a lot of time in motels, and all they give you to read is the Bible, I'm, I know it fairly by heart, and I certainly know the story of Joseph of Arimathea, and that he did indeed give his tomb to Jesus. But then if you read on further, Jesus wasn't there all that long. He was up and out in about three days. So this has infuriated the black suits, and they all got up and left in a body. But nobody followed them. In other words, it was well received by the people in the meeting. Do you, do you still keep up and see all the members of your family? Some of them, yeah, not all of them. Perhaps it was in the, your book, Final Conflict, a very funny story about... Um, when you were in the Communist Party and your mother came to San Francisco. Yes. <laughs> Can you tell what, what they, they had to, uh, you had to get a, a dispensation or something, wasn't that? Right, it? yeah, because they, you, know, you weren't allowed to have enemies of the working class. And so when I said, told her this, she said, I'm not an enemy of the working class. I think some of them are perfectly sweet. <laughs> <laughs> the Mitford family is, is in England legendary. Has that legend followed you to America? I don't think so, not really. I mean, um, um, well, uh, now Nancy, of course, has, has a sort of coterie of fans. Uh, almost anywhere you go, somebody will have read some of her books. I mean, that, that's across America, it's true. Um, but the, the others, uh, I don't think people have heard of all that much. I think it's probably fair to say that, that, that it's one of the most extraordinary families that England's ever produced or, or that's un been under one roof together. Have you got a ready answer to explain the, the whole Mitford Well, no, plan? that's the trouble. I mean, I'm always being asked that question, sort of what explains it all, and I never can think of the answer. I've tried my best in my books, you see, to sort of say, you know, to kind of analyze it, but I don't think I succeeded too well. <laughs> see, thank you very much. Right.